Okay, so let's start with that. My topic is basically mirroring the topic of, of my colleague, uh, state's use of force against international terrorist organization. Um, and I would like to thank uh, everyone for uh, organizing this uh, for me to, to present, especially to Professor Goran Ilik and Professor Mladen uh, Karolzowski and faculty of uh, Vitola University. Uh, I would like to warn everyone that some of my slides may use some pictures which would um, um, basically screen some form of nudity or, or some sor sort of graphic pictures of uh, civilian victims of terrorism. It won't be much, but just to, just to warn you, um, please brace yourself because uh, what I'm going to show you will perhaps change your perspective to certain um, certain ways of global policy makers. Uh, today's agenda uh, will talk about uh, the state's use of terrorism from basically four, five different dimensions. Uh, Russia's response towards the Chechen insurgency of, uh, from the beginning of 2000s uh, and nowadays, um, because this these events are interlinked with the uh, with today's situation in North Caucasus and Ukraine. We will discuss the US's response to Al-Qaeda of Osama bin Laden, Ayman uh, Zal Ahravi and his potential uh, successor Saif Al Abdel. And we will discuss the US res US's response to ISIS of Abu Bakr al Baghdadi and his successors. We will touch upon the Nigeria, Cameroon, Mali's response to Boko Haram insurgency in Central West Africa. We will also touch upon Israel's response to uh, Hezbollah, Hamas, and PLO um, in uh, Palestine slash Israel. Um, and uh, just a few words about me. Uh, I've recently graduated uh, philosophy, political philosophy, uh, but I'm deeply interested in conflict management, conflict resolution. Uh, and uh, I've been studying conflict in Syria, in Ukraine for the last, let's say, good 10, 15 years. And uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, I love dogs as well. Um, this is very interesting and very important topic because uh, when it comes to terrorism, um, we face difficulty with defining the term terrorism. Uh, for various reasons, uh, and I would like to uh, thank my basically intellectual mentor who taught me international terrorism during my uh, time at Manchester University between 2011 and 2013, Professor Emmanuel Pierre Goudin, uh, who basically uh, suggested that one person terrorist is another person's freedom fighter. We know that, don't we? Um, because uh, it all depends on the perspective and I'm into IR theory um, and all IR theories, all various approaches uh, of IR theory basically show um, different attitudes towards international terrorism or international uh, f f f freedom fight basically. When it comes to terrorism, very often we need to follow the money uh, it's not only about what we, uh, whom we know, what kind of terrorist organizations we identified. The question is who finances these these folks to pursue their uh, activities. When it comes to U.S. Department of Defense Dictionary of Military Terms, uh, there is such a suggestion that terrorism is a calculated use of unlawful violence or threat of unlawful violence to include fear intend to coerce or intimidate governments or societies in the pursuit of goals that are generally political, religious or ideological. My personal favorite uh, definition of terrorism is the systematic use of terror, especially as a means of coercion. Because it's, very, um, it's a very short definition and it actually uh, doesn't show any political leanings, it's not bias, prejudice, it just states the fact. When it comes to state, uh, you would say that s the definition of state is something that is uh, that we can take for granted. And most probably, yes, we can, but not everyone in this planet, there is uh, almost 8 billion of us, uh, sees state as something which is, uh, which is, which is uh, desirable, because uh, the status quo 
uh, and uh, approximately 204 countries which we have in the world don't recognize all of our uh, diversity, pluralism and differences of, of, of the humans. Some people, some na nationalities are denied uh, their uh, sovereignty, their uh, territorial integrity. So uh, that's the uh, one of the reasons why the debate is so heated, basically. Um, according to the traditional liberal and realist uh, approaches, uh, Max Weber's monopoly on violence uh, rule is still in place because Weber once said that a state holds a monopoly over the legitimate use of violence within its territory, meaning that violence perpetrated by other actors is, is illegitimate. And this uh, type of thinking dates back to uh, 1648, the Westphalian uh, peace treaty, which ended uh, the 30 year old, uh, the 30 years war, basically. And ever since we have this uh, static, basically, uh, understanding of, of, the, of the global uh, architecture of power and the state. And uh, terrorists are seen as uh, rebels uh, to be dealt by international actors who are recognized, meaning states and the political leaders of the states. Um, when it comes to classical uh, schools of IR theory, um, like I said, there is a strong, uh, strong um, emphasis on uh, stability, on on the um, basic uh, suggestion that it is states and international uh, relations, uh, international organizations that should uh, uh, govern us, and uh, all of those uh, political organizations who are not recognized or happen to be on the State Department's uh, list of terrorists should not um, resort to violence as political means. They should just um, get get on with their life. But that, that's not uh, the case, basically. When it comes, comes to post-structural uh, IR theory, uh, we have different approach because uh, and it's uh, they folks like uh, Bordeaux, Sartre or Derrida they wouldn't allow us to even uh, use the topic of today's presentation. Um, not it, they would suggest that it is not the state's use of force against uh, international terrorism, but political players' use of terrorism means against other political players using terrorism means. And um, especially uh, Pierre Bourdieu, uh, he was a, a philosopher who was very famous for the use of label. So he would suggest, for instance, that uh, um, when we use a label terrorist to identify someone, uh, we uh, automatically um, basically uh, suggest that he is not equal partner and he, he shouldn't be even invited to the policy making table uh, to talk about uh, any, um, any changes in the current status quo. And uh, post-colonialist, post-colonialist IR theories is pretty much straightforward. So they are pretty much following the same, um, the same uh, logic. Uh, but they would say that it's not the state's use of force against international terrorism, but the post-colonial power use of force against non-Western uh, political players. When it comes to neo-Marxists, uh, they would reformulate our topic of our today's uh, chat uh, to the imperialist powers use of power against proletarians. Pluritar uh, when it comes to the constructivists, um, they would say it's not the state's use of force against international terrorism, but the socially constructed state organizations use of force against socially constructed non-state actors. So uh, just to acknowledge my bias and my prejudice, because we all have certain things, we are academics, but we we uh, it's good that we if we come forward with certain things which are which we are leaning towards. So when it comes to IR theory, I happen to be a, a little bit of post colonialist, post colonialist, a bit of IR English school uh, thinker, a bit of post construct post constructivist, a bit of constructivist. Uh, a lot uh, of my leanings are um, based on my ontological uh, way of approaching things. I'm a bit of humanitarian. I'm, I'm definitely static, traditional, 
liberal institutionalists and I acknowledge the primacy of classical IR theories over new uh, IR theories, but I'm a liberal conservative and a bit of feminist. Uh, what I want to say is that recently I've coined one term which uh, hopes to bring IR theory together because there is many approaches that uh, tend to uh, disagree about basic things and it's good to bring them together for the purpose of the clarity of the conversation and I call it ontology in substance Andy. if anyone is interested after this lecture I can respond to your uh, uh, basic questions about it um, the sub truth is that as of 29th of November 2022 Max Weber's uh, uh, suggestion that state still hold, holds a monopoly over the legitimate use of violence within its territory is still true. Of course, there are some exceptions um, because we've learned to, um, after especially after the 20th century, after the Second World War and the Holocaust, we do not allow uh, the international actors to go to extreme to, to pursue their political objectives. Um, that's why we have UN, that's why we have uh, United Nations and UN Security Council to, to control certain countries from, contr from, uh, from going to extreme. And uh, that also is important to notice that uh, UN has its um, uh, basically protagonist in the League of Nations after the Second World War, but the League of Nations life was not very long, uh, it lasted just for 20 odd years. Uh, just until the Second World War. And the UN-based security system that we know, uh, and all of the legal terminology, legal uh, terms which we use today, have been developed after the Second World War by the representatives of Joseph Stalin and um, uh, Roosevelt slash um, his successor. Uh, also, uh, Brits help, but in general, um, the legal system which we like you know because you 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 are the experts you 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 represent uh, law in this conversation i'm more of the ir theorist and humanitarian and um, it's more than 78 years old so maybe we need to reformulate certain certain ways of approaching uh, legal um, terms and um, un based global security system is not perfect but that's the best uh, security system we know. So uh, I hope that we or our uh, children will be able to improve it in the future. Um, let's focus on the on the main topic of today's of my suggestion um, from the from the first slides. Uh, when it comes to the second Chechen war and Rush, Russia's response to second che Chechen war. Uh, we need to also acknowledge that during the Soviet years, a uh, Chechen minority was one of the worst treated by the by the Stalin and his successors, and that's why perhaps uh, when in 1991 uh, the Soviet Union br uh, collapsed, um, they happened to be the most uh, um, disappointed by the by the by the uh, changes. Uh, but the reaction of uh, Russia, and especially in, during the Second uh, Chechen War of Vladimir Putin, uh, was pretty much shocking. Uh, and uh, they used the label of terrorists to describe every single Chechen freedom fighter. Uh, so it would it would be easier for them to uh, to control the situation and to resolve the situation with force. Um, as we know, Vladimir Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin has been in, in charge of Russia for the last 22 years, but it is thanks to his uh, um, experiences, his ruthlessness, his decisiveness, assertiveness um, in Chechnya that uh, shown to Russian people that he's the only uh, leader they basically know because the opposites are basically drunk, in, ineffective and incompetent Boris Yeltsin. So that's why perhaps even now, even today in 2022, in the midst of the war in Ukraine, he still is one of the most respected Russian leaders among the Russian people. 
Uh, of course, he gave us some indicator what he's planning back in 2008, back in 2011, 2015, when he attacked uh, Syria or, or, or helped the regime to, to preserve his power. But in 2022, in February 2022, he basically out Machiavelli, Machiavelli himself. Because um, there are some of my colleagues in Poland and many colleagues in in the West who suggest that Russia is a terrorist state. And recently, um, even um, European Union, the European Union Parliament suggested that in the in one of the declarations. But from my perspective, uh, Russia is just using hybrid warfare. Unfortunately, um, it is a very dreadful, very uh, unhuman, but uh, kind of effective, unfortunately. Um, the hybrid uh, warfare includes uh, unconventional cyber attacks, uh, economic uh, repercussions, uh, disinformation, diplomatic uh, goals, irregular uh, warfare, and of course conventional means, like, like we see during the recent uh, war in Ukraine. Uh, but uh, again, uh, Putin uses uh, Chechens uh, and Wagner Group to commit the most uh, horrific uh, crimes against, against Ukrainian people. He still calls them terrorists, uh, or he dehumanizes them. Uh, in one of the future lectures, uh, in similar uh, format, I could uh, touch upon the Putinization of the situation of women and children during the 2022 Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, if you are interested in, in uh, such lecture, please contact Professor Mladen uh, Karadzowski, who might arrange it. Um, in general, uh, my paper, my recent paper, suggests that the latest unprovoked and brutal war in Ukraine uh, that started recently uh, has been reminiscent of some of the most dreadful experiences in the Balkan pa uh, past. And the, the paper uh, aims to bring awareness to the dire humanitarian rights abuses and the systematic institutional abuse committed by on Ukrainian civilians, predominantly by Russian army during the uh, first 200 de days of the operation. What you can see in this picture, perhaps you, you've seen that recently on social media, this is a blatant example of the st state terrorism or the use of state terrorism by Russia against Ukraine. The recent a systematic attack on the country electric grid has basically destabilized the whole country, the whole Ukraine at the brink of very long and perhaps cold winter. So this is a practical application, practical example of what the terrorism, state terrorism is. And if we go to the basic or the terrorism which we know, um, and we need to also notice that uh, United States and the Western allies are not so eager to respond to certain terrorist attacks like they were some 20, 21 years ago. And the uh, Al-Qaeda or ISIS of today is also not Al-Qaeda of, uh, of 2001. Um, and basically, um, it's been 21 years since the 9-11 attacks and Al-Qaeda is still on, not defeated. And uh, it's not only Al-Qaeda, but ISIS, for instance, we all have heard about San Sanjar massacre in, in Iraq against Yazidi populations. What ISIS did in, back in 2015, it was a pure genocide. And it was not only Yazidi population, but also Iraqi military servicemen and uh, Christians and, and uh, Shia militias of, from different countries. So uh, when it comes to the label of terrorism, some groups truly deserve to be labeled terrorists, whereas others, like freedom fighters from different organizations, uh, they don't, uh, from humanitarian perspective. Uh, the problem is that when US decides to strike against uh, certain terrorists, like for instance, I, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi was killed by the drone attack. Abu Ibrahim al-Hasim al-Karasi was 
uh, who replaced him uh, as a, a sheikh or, or leader of uh, Islamic uh, State was also killed by drone attack on uh, 3rd of February 2022. We still don't know who, who are who will be their um, successors, successors, but the question is also about the ethics of drone attacks, artificial intelligence and robotics. Uh, because drone attacks that resulted in the political killings of Osama bin Laden, Ayman al Zahrawi, uh, and Abu Bakr al Baghdadi did not stop their followers from counting their, uh, for continuing their, their deadly strategies. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, this produces more violence, more hostility. The response of the Western powers in, for the last 21 years has been also disproportionate because uh, I recently came across with this figure. In Afghanistan, for the last 21 years, 243,000 people were killed, and more than 70,000 of them have been civilians. Um, and uh, as we know, some basically 12 or 13 months ago, uh, Afghan president and uh, the leader of, of the country who uh, who were installed or, or strongly supported by Western powers in Afghanistan just fled the country when Taliban approached the capital. So uh, the political stability of Afghanistan and, and uh, the, the state building project uh, has failed completely in this country. This has a broader consequences, but the question is uh, when it comes to the actual terrorists is how do they how did they f survive so long? And this, o this is also to do with certain countries, because like you know, Afghanistan borders Pakistan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, and Iran. Uh, and for a very long time, as you know, uh, Osama bin Laden found safe haven in Pakistan. And his su successors also found uh, very uh, safe haven in Pakistan, just basically a few hundred meters from the Pakistani uh, military uh, academy. So uh, it also shows that certain countries are interested in supporting terrorist groups because it's in their favor. Um, when it comes to Iraq, this same uh, figure which I've recently uh, um, recently came across, it was almost 200,000 Iraqi civilians were killed by direct vo violence since the US invasion in 2003. And, um, we very often use in, we in the West such terms as collateral damage, which is injury inflicted on something other than an intended target uh, that causes a lot of uh, death and destruction. We can use this collateral damage in different languages because it's very often, uh, uh, you can all, all very often find it in Mandarin, Russian, French, Spanish, Italian, uh, Latin, even Latin, uh, even. Uh, um, ancient uh, Italians, basically, or Romans, let's say, uh, knew this uh, term. And um, I followed the patterns of radicalization of Al Qaeda, ISIS, Al Nusra, uh, some Free Syrian army uh, uh, fighters also got radicalized over the last 12 years. I followed the patterns of radicalization of Al Qaeda in uh, Iraq. Uh, in Syria, in uh, Ara Arabian Peninsula, in Yemen, in Libya, in Ethiopia, in Mali. Uh, and the common denominator is that basically in all of these regions, um, the ideology which is used by um, terrorists uh, and, and the people who recruit them is very appealing to people who are without any means of survival, of survival, and um, who face very dreadful uh, um, um, circumstances. And um, when we talk about unemployment in Europe, in our part of Europe, we would say that oh, there is unemployment or, of four or five percent, and that's a, such a massive drama. In these countries, in uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, Iraq, uh, Mali, uh, Algeria. Yemen, Somalia, the unemployment sometimes uh, goes up to 80-85% among the young populations. So uh, we shouldn't be surprised that uh, certain radicals who go there 
and uh, try to destabilize the situation are very successful. We also need to follow when it comes to the terrorism or, or the uh, organizations which actually uh, use terrorism means uh, to project their power and influence, some local actors like Boko Haram, because the, the time of Al-Qaeda and ISIS might be, uh, might be slowly um, reaching the end, but um, when it comes to Boko Haram, it has been defeated in Nigeria, but it's very influential in Nigeria, Chad uh, and um, Cameroon, especially ar around the Lake uh, Chad region. Lake Chad used to be uh, one of the biggest lakes in the world, but ever since 1960s, 90% of its uh, water has basically shrunk because of the climate change, because of the irrigation system and and over usage of water for agricultural uh, purposes. And uh, this, this happens to be in one of the poorest regions in the world. Um, and we, we, of course, are aware of the Bring Back Our Girls um, campaign um, that was very, very um, powerful on social media some five, four years ago. Uh, Boko Haram uh, kidnapped Chibok school, uh, school girls. Uh, some of them were released, some of them disappeared. Uh, but these desperate people use desperate means to survive, unfortunately. Um, and this is definitely applicable to Sa Sahel region. So what we saw a couple of years ago, 2015, 2016, in Iraq and uh, in Syria, and this um, unexpected growth of ISIS and Al Qaeda linked groups uh, that might happen anytime soon in Sahel region because of desperation of local people and child malnutrition, which is just basically um, it's shameful to watch from the Western perspective what, that we do not do anything to, to help these people. And then we, we wonder oh, why are these people ra ra radicalized so much? The scarcity of the water supplies. Uh, is basically also uh, applicable to Israel and Palestine. Um, as we know in Israel and uh, there are areas A, B, C, some of uh, the uh, area C is the one which is with the least uh, supply of water uh, and this area C happens to be um, populated by majority of po uh, Palestinian population because, because water is a as important as oil in this region. And um, in, when it comes to um, Israel-Palestine uh, political um, disputes, very often it's, it's related to water. So um, desperation dr drives people to, to extreme. And Hamas and Hezbollah uses terrorism means to achieve their political goals. Hamas tries to be become a political party, but they are not recognized. Uh, Fatah is more of the uh, party which is which is more uh, which West which, which the West is is uh, more keener to recognize as a as a um, political representation of the Palestinian people, but it's not the only one. Um, as we, uh, that's, that's, by the way, that's the map of uh, Israel in 1947 uh, uh, and nowadays uh, the green territories are under Palestinian rule, the white are under uh, Israelis and, and um, the green uh, happen to be also related to the territories that there is lack of water basically. And um, I will skip a couple of slides because I want to leave time for, for, uh, for questioning for questions afterwards, but, but um, in general, um, that could be also an independent lecture of on the political situation in Israel. Um, I just want to mention that it's not only Palestinian people who use terrorism um, against the Palestine, but also Israel uh, uses certain acts of terrorism against Palestinian people as well. Uh, one of the most uh, famous cases is Yasser Arafat's death. Um, well, there's no proof uh, to that, uh, but uh, the rumor has it that he has been poisoned. And even though the French uh, doctors didn't uh, 
didn't uh, show any evidence to 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 prove that um, the cause of his death was a poison. And uh, the person here, uh, whom you see in, in the picture, is Khaled Marshal, uh, the leader of Hamas, uh, who basically was there was an uh, assassination attempt against his life in 1997, and uh, some Mossad's. Um, agents approached him and uh, sprayed uh, spraying his ear and he basically ended up in hospital in reanimation uh, and uh, as he described the the attack uh, basically the information um, was sent to the iraqi king who demanded from israelis to send the antidote and they did and he survived and he became the mortar of the of the uh, Palestinian people ever since. This man here, Ahmed Yassin, um, whom you see in the wheelchair, um, also a spiritual leader of uh, Hamas, he, um, he was known for his uh, not only radical views and, and the, the fact that he was a, he was basically um, author of many political killings himself, but but uh, he was assassinated by Israeli AH-64 Apache helicopter uh, whilst he was going for a morning prayer in his uh, local mosque. Uh, he was, uh, it shows that the ruthlessness of certain political regimes um, because, you know, when you send the Apache helicopter to, to assassinate a disabled person, it doesn't look good, basically. But we also know the recent example of uh, Al Jazeera uh, journalist Shiren Abu Akla, who was basically uh, shot by one of the Israeli soldiers uh, whilst she was uh, online. Um, she was reporting. It shows that the ruthlessness of of uh, Israel state. Uh, but it, 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 we shouldn't be surprised because I come from the Poland. Uh, I come from the country which was affected by Holocaust the most, and and uh, and the Israeli the Israelis know that that's the, they need to do everything to protect their country because otherwise they unfortunately are not welcome anywhere else. Uh, and, uh, and all of these three folks upstairs, uh, upstairs let's say, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, Naftali Bennett, and uh, Yarid Lapid, the current the current Prime Minister of Israel. They are driven by the same doctrine, like Golda Meir. Every civilization finds it necessary to negotiate compromises within its own values. Okay, so when it comes to values, we that that's the pictures of uh, which I've mentioned in the beginning. That's the pictures of uh, U.S. Uh, soldiers, U.S. officers, uh, torturing and uh, mistreating. Iraqi and uh, Yemeni as well as Syrian prisoners in, uh, in Abu Ghraib uh, uh, prisoner um, uh, prison and, and um, also we don't know what, what was happening in Guantanamo Bay uh, but it, those pictures show the states um, states um, basically uh, use of terrorist means to achieve their political goals. Um, again, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. Um, the person whom you see in this picture, uh, Miss Lanit England, was actually, um, was actually punished for what she, what she did during, during her time as a, as a, um, as a guard of the of this prison, and uh, she spent some 500 days in prison for 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 the cruelties which she inflicted on the um, on the inmates in um, Abu Ghraib uh, Grab, um, detention center. Um, but again, the people who are responsible for for certain uh, crimes are just instruments in the hands of the much more powerful men. And I don't want to blame Americans in this aspect only because it's every single uh, superpower who uses terrorism as a as a means of attaining their political um, goals. Um, when it comes to China dealing with Muslim population in Xinjiang region, 
Um, there, there are reports uh, of mistreatment, of uh, surveillance, of religious uh, restrictions on forced labor uh, and forced sterilization of Muslim uh, populations of uh, this Xinjiang region, which is populated by majority, almost majority of, of Muslim populations. Um, so I'd say that uh, when it comes to the state's use of the force against the terrorist organization, uh, whatever we try to do um, in terms of regulating the, the aspect, uh, the, the, this, this, this very pressing international issue, it wouldn't uh, work unless we make some significant changes to the way the UN Security Council operates. Because otherwise, uh, the superpowers, the regional powers who happen to be the UN security members will act with impunity. And, uh, um, you know, uh, some populations are not without the uh, blame because, like, for instance, uh, Uyghurs, uh, they, they happen to be uh, the most politically violent uh, minority in China. But still, still, um, we, or especially lawyers, you guys, need to need to do more to resolve this pressing international uh, matter. And I would like to thank you for your attention and thank you very much for um, entertaining this presentation today.